worshiped our Father, God of all comfort. We're so thankful for the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And Father, you are the, you are the God of peace. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And Lord, we invite him in these moments to rule in our minds, in our thoughts, and our hearts, in our attitudes. And we ask, Father, that, that as we sing our songs together, that it would just, they would just be an overflow of the true, uh, the true nature and beliefs of our hearts this morning. And that, God, God, you would find our praise just a sacrifice to your glory. And so, Lord, enter in. We pray that you would enter in to this time and help us to draw near to you and you have promised to draw near to us. And so we just come humbly seeking your face. We come away from the world and the things of the world and the cares and anxieties and fears. And we just ask for the peace of Jesus upon us as we sing his praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Amen. Let's stand.
you wish that you could see it all made new? Father, we thank you today for a chance to be here to sing these songs of truth and just love how uh, gathering together, um, singing truth, listening to your word, uh, how it recalibrates our, our minds and our spirits back to the true north of you. And uh, I just pray, God, that you would help us today, that you would soften our hearts to your word. And I pray that you would help pastor as he brings the message that you would just uh, bless him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I 
Thank you, praise team. What awesome declarations that we just sang. Man, if I can't preach after that, I just need to hang it up. So find somebody else to do this. I invite you to turn to Ruth chapter 1. several burdens on my heart this morning and so we're going to we're going to pray again and I would just invite you to uh, to join me and we're going to pray uh, before we pray I'll just share with you um, and and give thanks to the Lord first and foremost but also thanks to all of those who um, had a part in the memorial service Friday for Shirley Lindau and just uh, making that happen um, I, I, I believe the family was blessed by that, and, uh, and so thank you to all who served. Um, <clears throat> throughout the course of that memorial service, the gospel was shared several times, and, and at the end I gave an invitation, and at least four people raised their hand to, um, to receive Christ, and so uh, we rejoice in that, amen. <clears throat> And so praise the Lord for uh, just the, the working, uh, his working, the Spirit's working in that service and, and just, um, just a powerful testimony of a life well lived uh, and, and a life of love, okay, a life of love. And, uh, and surely I believe after, after hearing and knowing what I know about her and, and hearing what I heard about her on uh, Friday, uh, she was one who loved and, and so I'm grateful for that. Uh, those, are, those are easy funerals, uh, as, as funerals go. Uh, those are the easier ones to officiate. Um, we're also gonna, gonna just pray today for Jim uh, Lindau, um, for JC uh, Reed, um, and then uh, I think McKenna has a, a, a procedure this week as well. Let's pray for McKenna. Um, and we're going to pray for, for some others here. And there's, uh, what I understand, some protests that are um, on the schedule today in Adrian. And so let's pray about that. Let's just commit um, that to the Lord and our nation to the Lord. And so join with me and let's uh, pray about these things. Father, we, we just delight to come into your presence and are thankful that you invite us in through the shed blood of Jesus and in his powerful name. And so we come to you, Father, not on any merit of our own right now, because Lord, we know that, that on our own, we don't deserve anything. And on our own, we could not even enter in to your presence, but God, through, through faith in Christ, um, you invite us uh, to come and to come boldly. And so we pray and give you thanks this morning. We give you bold thanks for the souls that were saved on Friday, Father, um, uh, Sharon shared with uh, Jason and I this morning that uh, one of her uh, grandsons got saved here in the last uh, week or two. So we're so thankful for that, God. We're thankful for the Spirit of God's moving. Um, during this quarantine time, there, there have been a couple of our children who have been saved, and so we're grateful for your Holy Spirit's working in their hearts. And God, I know many others that I haven't heard about uh, and so thank you, God, for uh, the working of your spirit. And we pray that he would be at work in our midst today, uh, that if anyone is here that does not know Christ as their savior, I pray that the testimony of Ruth would just speak to their hearts in such a way as to draw them uh, to repentance and trust in Jesus. Uh, Lord, uh, I do and we do pray for Jim Lindau today and, and Father, as, <clears throat> as family begins to head back home and, and he is in a house by himself, Lord, I pray that uh, you would uh, just minister comfort to his heart and help him know that he is not alone and, and Father, may the peace of Jesus just rule and reign in his heart and mind in these days and months ahead as he... Um, as he adjusts to a new normal. Uh, Father, um, I pray this morning uh, for 
uh, JC, and we thank you for successful uh, surgery for her this week, and just pray for healing on her body. Uh, we pray for McKenna and the procedure she has this week, that you would um, help that to go well, Father. We pray that you would give her peace and rest in you. Help Jason and Missy as they um, care for their kids, and um, uh, we just pray that, uh, God, you would uh, just grace them with your power and love. Uh, Lord, um, we pray for those in our midst who are dealing with cancer and just struggling uh, with that. And Father, um, <clears throat> I pray that they, would, that they would struggle well to the glory of Jesus and that they would have victory. Um, God, that you would continue uh, to give them grace as they battle and Father, I'm always amazed at them, how their uh, attitudes reflect the love and the grace and the peace and the faith of Christ. And, and so I pray that you would just continue to adorn their spirits with uh, that peace. And uh, Father, um, God, I don't have to tell you this morning that our world is in chaos, that our nation is divided. Uh, we are the divided states of America. And uh, Lord, I pray that today, even in these uh, protests planned for Adrian, that the peace of Jesus would rule and reign, that you would um, protect folks, that you would calm hearts, that Father, you would turn hearts to a saving knowledge of Christ so that Father, instead of the justice that we cry for, oh God, we know that, that justice Justice has been served for those who would trust in Jesus at Calvary. And so I pray, God, this is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. And so I pray that we as your church, that other churches in our community uh, would be bold in our love, bold in speaking peace and life and the gospel. And so, Lord, we pray for the peace of Jesus in these protests today. We pray for those in authority, for our police officers, that you would have your hand of protection over them. And God, that you would uh, work in their hearts and, uh, and use them as a catalyst for peace as well. Lord, we just give you the glory and the praise for all of these things. We ask for your help now as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Ruth chapter one. Last week I gave you an introduction uh, to this book, and we really covered the first five verses and the last couple of verses. Uh, today I want to read the whole chapter, okay, so it'll take a couple minutes here and we'll, we'll just uh, read that, so please follow along with me. And, and I hope, if you were here last week, I hope that it will remind you of what we studied last week. Um, and so if you were not here last week and you haven't had a chance to listen to that message, I invite you to go back and do that. It'll be helpful for you. Uh, verse one, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the, name, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? 
Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law goes back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where, I, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. I really want to focus in today on verses 16 and 17 with you and to look at the testimony of this Moabite woman, Ruth, and to see her conversion. It is an extraordinary faith of what is otherwise an ordinary woman, right? Um, but this is an extraordinary uh, testimony, an extraordinary declaration of her faith and trust in the God of Israel as she uh, counts, he, she clings to, to uh, Naomi and she counts herself as one of the Israelites. Very powerful testimony. It reflects on our testimony of faith today. She is, she is an unlikely convert. And friends, true faith is sometimes born out of extraordinary circumstances in the most ordinary and unlikely people. Uh, when you consider that statement that I wrote there, true faith is sometimes born out of extraordinary circumstances in the most ordinary and unlikely people. Honestly, we all fit that description. Um, I think we're probably all, in the light of eternity, all of us are ordinary people and all of, us are, all of us were unlikely to come to Jesus. Would you agree with that about yourself? That, that listen, I, I look back over my life and I say, man, I was unlikely to come to Jesus. And yet, and yet God intersected my life and intersected my heart and, and changed and redirected the course of my life through repentance, my own repentance and faith in Christ. And it was the Holy Spirit who drew me to that place of repentance. And so what we read in verses 16 and 17 is, is an astounding confession of an unlikely convert to faith in the living God of Israel. And so Ruth's confession of faith shows, shows her character and something in her that God was stirring in her. It shows that she was acting in bravery, that she was courageous, that she was bold, and that in her declaration of faith and in her clinging to Naomi, there was a risk-taking spirit alive that was born alive in her. And I'm telling you, if you trusted, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior or if you have yet to trust, all of that is entailed in your confession of faith. So, so if you have believed on Jesus as your Savior, I'm telling you, it has, it has shown in you a sense of bravery, a sense of courageousness, a boldness, and a risk-taking spirit that was born alive in you through the working and the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God by which you came to faith and trust in Christ. And if you have yet to believe on Christ... 
It will take all of that. It will take the Spirit of God stirring all of that in your soul, drawing you to repentance and trust in Jesus. Her, her declaration of faith is nothing less than extraordinary. And so how does Ruth come to faith in, in the God of Israel? That's question number one I want us to consider this morning. How, how does Ruth come to faith in the God of Israel? I'm going to answer that question in the first point in your notes, and then I'm going to answer the second question in the rest of your notes. How is the genuineness of Ruth's faith put on display? So like we're, we're going we're gonna to see the answer, how does Ruth come to faith in the God of Israel, and then we're going we're gonna to dig deep and we're going to understand how it is that her faith is put on display. And in seeing her faith put on display, you and I can see how we can put and how we do put our faith on display in a world that desperately needs to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, a world that's desperately in need of a relationship, a transforming relationship with Jesus. Listen, the world does not need religion today. The world needs a relationship. They need a relationship with the living God. They need a relationship with Jesus who has broken down the wall of separation. He's torn it down and he has made the way clear so that, so that all can come to him, whoever wants to come to him. And so point number one in answer to the question, how does Ruth come to faith in the God of Israel? Genuine faith must have a contagion from which it is born. In other words, there's got to be something that drew her like, like, right, we know, we know that ultimately, let me just say this at the beginning, we know that ultimately it's God who draws us, okay? God draws us to faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. Okay, the Holy Spirit is active. He's working in this world. He's drawing souls. He's convicting of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He's doing all of that work in our world today. And he did that work in your heart if you've come to him. And so, so we know that it's the Holy Spirit who draws us. And we know that the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to draw us. Now, now think about Ruth and her day. And, and think about what, what of the Word of God that she and others had. Okay? And they did not have the full, obviously they did not have the New Testament. Obviously they did not have all the history of Israel from the days of the judges uh, forward. Okay, so they, so they, had, they had the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They had uh, possibly Joshua, and the, that, they certainly had that history of Joshua right on the heels of it. They certainly lived in their day, and how did they interpret their day? Uh, th that question is an interesting question that I won't get into. How do we interpret our day? How do we interpret the news of the day? Uh, how do we see it in light of Scripture? Okay, it's beyond the scope of this message, but Ruth, I would submit to you, is drawn to faith out of association. She is, just humanly speaking, she is drawn to faith out of association. In verse 4 and 5, uh, the two sons of Elimelech and Naomi, Malon and Chilion, we, we covered this last week, they do what's right in their own eyes, which was the mark of their generation. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, okay? It is the mark of our generation that everyone does whatever's right in their own eyes. Primarily, that's the general nature of the world that we live in. And so Malon and Chilion took Moabite wives, which they were not supposed to do. And so... Uh, Malon was married to Ruth and Chilion was married to Orpah and they lived in Moab about 10 years and both Malon and Chilion died so that Naomi is left with her two Moabite daughters-in-law. And I'm, and I'm suggesting to you, I'm, I'm sort of reading into the text here a little bit because, well, maybe a lot, um, Ruth is drawn, I'm suggesting that Ruth is drawn to faith in the God of Israel by association with this family who's a family of Israel, that they are a family of faith, okay? And, and you might say, well, that's not, you, you didn't give that impression last week, Pastor Jeff, when you were preaching and you were saying how imperfect their faith is. Well, hello, um, I, I can relate to that because my faith is very much imperfect. And I think you're going to see that this should encourage us today. So Ruth, a Moabite, marries into this Jewish family and, and she presumably 
would have been instructed in Jewish history and worship by Naomi to a great degree. Now, the Bible does not tell us what Naomi's attitude was towards her two sons marrying two foreigners. The Bible doesn't say uh, what her attitude was in the days leading up to and approaching their marriage. But I think we get a firm picture, a clear picture in Ruth chapter one of what Naomi's attitude was towards them once they did marry. That she embraced them, that she accepted them into her family. Uh, and, And in embracing them and in accepting them into her family, I'm just suggesting to you that she certainly would have told Um, uh, Ruth and Orpah about the God of Israel, that she would have told told her daughters-in-law about um, the deliverance of her people from slavery in Egypt and the parting of the sea and the conquering of the land of Canaan. (coughs) Ruth is also drawn to faith, I believe, out of godly affection. If you look at this, uh, verses 9 and 10, verse 14, verse uh, 16, you, you begin to see a picture here. Verse 9 and 10, the Lord grant that you may find rest. This is Naomi's words to Orpah and Ruth. Each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, no, we will turn with you to your people. Okay, and then verse uh, 14 And then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So you see in these verses that there there is a relationship, there is a relationship of love, of godly affection that has been developed between these women, okay? Ruth clings to Naomi. She fastens herself to her. She would not let, she would not let Naomi, her mother-in-law, out of her sight, Naomi had obviously made a great impact on Ruth because we don't generally cling to those we don't like. There is true admiration here. There is true admiration. Both Orpah and Ruth expressed strong desire to return to Judah with Naomi. Naomi's interest in them and her selflessness in accepting them and teaching them into the family and caring for them surely must have generated admiration from them. Remember also that these ladies are grieving together. All three of them are widows. They have all suffered deep losses. Uh, Naomi on her part has not only lost her husband but now her two sons she has buried. And so they are, they're grieving together and, and those bonds of grief run and they sink deep and they do nothing but strengthen the bond between them. They share in common this grief for their loved ones and those ties of grief bind their hearts strongly together. And so there's true love and there's true companionship between these ladies. And, and f- listen, for all of Naomi's bitterness that comes out in Ruth chapter 1, For all of her bitterness and discouragement, Ruth is attracted to the faith of her mother-in-law and to her people and to her God. And I'm saying to us this morning, church, that this should greatly encourage us because, again, Naomi did not have a perfect faith. And, and, and I don't know about you, but, but I do know about me and how often I question my, my, in, in the face of my sin and my failures, daily failing and sinning against God. God, how could you possibly use me as a preacher of your gospel? How could you possibly use me in this world to draw anybody to salvation in Christ? And maybe you've thought the same thing. This this greatly encourages me because, because it tells me and it tells you that we don't have to have a perfect faith for God to use us. God uses Naomi and her imperfect faith Even in in a place of sorrow and deep bitterness, she uses her, or God uses her to draw Ruth to himself. Naomi's character and her faith are contagious enough to sway Ruth to to, to cling to Naomi, but also to cling to the God of Israel. And so in this relationship, it becomes clear that that love can indeed cover a multitude of sins. 
And love, the love of Jesus that unites the body of Christ together, the love of Christ th through us and in us on display outside these walls is a powerful force. I'm telling you, church, it is the powerful force by which God intends for us to season the world with grace, for us to season our community with the love of Christ and so the church, the church ought to love others who look different than us. The church, this is, this is a message that I think preaches and applies to right where we are today in all the midst of violence and chaos and cities burning. That the church in these moments, listen church, the darker this world gets, the brighter the love of Jesus Christ will shine into it if we, the church, will humble ourselves and shine that love. So, so we love those. We love those who look different. We love those who are different culturally than us. We, we love others who don't and won't always agree with us. And we learn to speak with civility. And we learn, God, help us. God, Spirit of God, enter in and season my words. And, and may he season your words with the grace of Jesus Christ and with the kindness and the love and the mercy of Christ so that the church would be salt and light in a world in a world that is desperately crying out for, for what they don't understand, for what they are blind to, because I know, because I was once blind to it and you were blind to it. They're crying out for justice. And I'm telling you, friends, there is justice in two places. You find justice in two places. At Calvary, you find justice at Calvary if you will surrender your heart and trust in Jesus Christ, justice, your, what you deserved, what I deserved, was poured out on Calvary on Jesus Christ. You can find justice there or you can find justice at the great white throne. See, one way or the other, God is a God of justice. But see, it's not ours to judge that. It is our, it is our ministry and our joy and our pleasure, church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the love of Christ, and that kind of love is contagious. And it's exactly the kind of love with which Jesus has loved us. Because we look at rioters and looters and we say they don't deserve the love of Christ. I sat on my couch Tuesday afternoon and I watched a video of a husband and a wife defending their property. I don't forget what city it was in. And I watched thugs beating them on the streets of one of our cities in this country. Thugs beating them, like three or four of them attacking this woman. And then they picked up a two by four and they started beating them with a two by four. And they look at that and they say, they don't deserve, they don't deserve the grace of God. But I'm just saying to you, neither did I. Neither did I. But oh, that the church might pray, might pray for the grace of God somehow, somewhere, that in the depths of the hearts of those who are destroying and killing, that the grace of God would intersect their hearts so that they, they would cry out to Christ and receive mercy, the undeserved mercy, the undeserved grace of God which I received at the age of 19 years old in my bitter and angry heart. And so this is how, this is how Ruth came to faith in the God of Israel. I believe she learned it through association with this family and then there was love and affection poured into her acceptance. So then, Ruth's faith, how is it displayed? Well, it must be tested to reveal its authenticity. So let me just give you these real quickly. 
and I'm not going to go back through and revisit. You have the verses. Do you have the verses in your? I'm going to give you the verses, but I'm not going to go back and read them. Verse 8, verse 11 through 13, and verse 18. There's the test of Naomi's discouragement. This is, this is just Naomi, I believe in her. She's trying to do her best to care for her daughters-in-law. She has nothing to offer them personally. And so she's discouraging them from returning to Israel, from, from returning to Judah and the, the city of Bethlehem. She's discouraging them. Go back to your own people. She isn't even trying at this point. She's not even trying to point them to faith in God at this point. She's actually pointing them back to their idolatry. Ruth, on her part, has, has set her heart on clinging to Naomi and to the God of Israel, whom she has now put her faith in. But Naomi is doing everything, seemingly doing everything in her power to discourage her from following through. Uh, maybe, maybe the most saddening and disheartening thing is is that in verse 18, right, right on the heels of Ruth's profession of faith in the God of Israel, it says, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She, she stopped discouraging her, but she, neither did she encourage her. And so she just fell silent. What a test of Ruth's commitment to the God of Israel that must have been for her mother-in-law to fall silent in those moments after trying to dissuade her from coming with her. And then there's the test of comfort from a worldly life, the test of comfort from a worldly life. Verse 9 and 10 and 15, you see that, that Naomi is encouraging Orpah and Ruth to return to their people. I mean, look, Ruth is, a, Ruth is still a young woman, she can go back. She can marry one of her own people and, and she doesn't have any kids at this point. She can go back and she can start fresh and she can start over and begin a life together with someone else and a, a life of peace and ease in this world, presumably. What a test that must have been the temptation to return to a worldly life and to the comforts of family and home. Then there's the test of the example of Orpah, who in verse 15 we find has turned back to her people and to her gods. This certainly must have been a test on Ruth's heart. And then finally, there's the test of the emptiness and the sorrow of Naomi, which I, I talked about last week in verses 21 and 22. Imagine, imagine how Ruth might have felt upon returning to or, or, or turning and going with Naomi and as they come into Bethlehem, she hears her mother-in-law say, do not call me pleasant, but call me bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. She said, all I have is my Moabite daughter-in-law. Imagine how that may have cut in Ruth's heart. And I'm just suggesting to you that all these are tests that are taking place in Ruth's newfound profession of faith and confession of faith in the God of Israel. And I'll just say to you, there's no question that when we put our faith in Christ, it will be tested by the elements of this world and by the circumstances of this life. And I would say that every day our faith is put to the test. Today, this very day, your faith will be put to the test. My faith will be put to the test. In whatever form or fashion that happens, it will be tested. The genuineness of our profession is tried over and over again throughout our life's journey. And, and listen, Satan's aim, the devil's aim, is to get us to shrink back in fear, to go back to the old life, to go back to our Moabite heritage, if you will, and, and to throw our towel away from Christ, throw in, the, throw in the towel of our profession, and to return to a, a life of ease and peace and comfort. And I'm telling you, church, as, as this world descends further and further into lawlessness, that temptation is going to grow in your heart, in my heart. The temptation to compromise our faith and to turn back to the old life, that is the devil's aim. There have been plenty of that going on even in Christianity in recent months and years. Several high-profile Christians have 
come out and renounce their faith in Jesus because Jesus somehow no longer fits into the scheme of their life. I'm telling you, God's aim is to take the testing of our faith and to refine our faith through the fires of this life so that the impurities of our faith and in our faith are removed. That God is seeking to purify your faith God is seeking to purify my faith, that God has promised to do that. This is no doubt God's aim in Naomi's trials and losses that she has suffered. It is no doubt God's aim to prove the genuineness of Ruth's newfound confession of faith in him. And it is no doubt that it is God's aim in your heart and life today. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession, the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 4, 14, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of self-control. So we see that Ruth's faith was put on display through the testings of the circumstances of life. And then genuine faith must identify itself with God's people. You see the testimony her testimony in verse 16, just this one phrase, your people will be my people. Really? Your people will be my people. Now think about this, this statement that Ruth is a, up to this point, a Gentile woman, an unbeliever, a pagan, a, whatever title we want to put on that. She's an unbeliever up until her confession, the point of her belief. But in her confession, she says, your people will be my people. Now think about the people of Israel. Think about the people of Israel today. Think about the, the historical nature of the world's attitude to the nation of Israel, to the Jews. That countless times over the course of human history, the world has sought to snuff out this nation, this people, the Jews. And, and Ruth says to her mother-in-law, I forsake my people, I'm gonna be a part of your people. What? You're gonna what? You really wanna do that? I mean, this is astounding because the Jews are a hated people. They're a hated nation. The Jews have never been loved in this world. They are not loved in this world today. And yet, Ruth, clings to Naomi and then clings to the God of Israel and clings to God's people. By identifying herself with the people of God, she is placing herself in a no man's land and opening up herself up to rejection from both angles, from every side. I'm just gonna say this, okay, because you're here, you're in church. You don't forsake the church. Right? Amen? Because you're here. Paramount to putting your faith in Jesus today is your willingness to be identified with God's people today, which is the church. Okay? So, so the church, the church is no more honored in society than the nation of Israel. The church is not honored in our culture. The church is the church bears the name of Jesus, but she also bears the scorn that goes with that name as well, that comes from the world. And, and the church, local churches that litter the landscape, even the best of churches, the churches that hold fast to the gospel, that preach and declare the gospel of the crucified and risen Christ, even those churches are grossly imperfect, just like Israel was and is grossly imperfect. The church on a human level is full of contradictions. We are full of hypocrisies. We are stricken by our own messes. We are full of conflict and strife. 
The church is despised among unbelievers. They don't get us. They don't get why you're here this morning. There are, there are men and women who profess to know Christ as their Savior who don't get why you're here this morning. Yet our faith in Jesus calls us to be numbered amongst his people, the church. I've shared this with you before, and I've heard in our culture this thought, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And I'm just saying, I'm sorry, that does not wash. That does not wash. Not, not if you study your Bible, not if you're a Bible person, that does not wash. Okay, and, and can you be a Jesus person without being a Bible person? I'll let you answer that, but the answer is no. <laughs> Think about that. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I say you, you love Jesus, but you hate his bride. So, so like if, if me and my wife are friends with, with other couples, we are friends with other couples, but if I, were to, if I were to say to another man, dude, I love you, you're a brother in Christ. We're friends to the end, but I hate your wife. <laughs> I can't stand her. If it, if it comes down to me and my wife hanging out with you and your wife, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not going there, all right? We can get together. We can play ball. We can, we can play golf. We can, we can hang out, but keep her away from me. See, isn't that the same? I love Jesus, who is the husband of the church, Oh, Jesus, I love you, but your church, I can't stand her. I'm not going to be a part of her. Or, or Jesus, I love you as the head, but your body? Ugh. The church? <laughs> now, what does that look like? Right? If I, if I, let me, let me make it less personal. If somebody, <laughs> if somebody comes to you and says, you're really, you're a, you're a beautiful person. You, you, from, from, the, from the neck up, <laughs> from the neck up, you, you're gorgeous. You're handsome. You're, you're beautiful. But from the shoulders down, <laughs> stop. Exactly. Stop. Amen. Out of the mouth of babes. Just stop. Imagine if Ruth had said such a thing to, to Naomi. Naomi, I'll, I'll never take your people to be my people, but I do take your God to be my God. I don't think that would have washed over very well, neither with Naomi nor with God. I'm trying to tell you, if you're, if you're going if you're gonna to be a Christian, be, be, a, be a Bible person. The entire New Testament was written to churches and to the leaders of churches. So how can you be a believer and, and forsake the church, forsake gathering together with the church. The entire epistle of 1 John is written to refute such nonsense, okay? That somehow you can love Jesus and hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. No, by this they will know that you belong to me, that you are truly my disciple, that you love one another. In all of our messes, in all of our disagreements, we love each other because the bonds of Christ usurp everything. Why would we, why would we feel this way? I just gotta say this. I, for all of our imperfections, for all of our inconsistencies, and all of the sometimes quarreling and on occasion our fleshliness of the church, my fleshliness, yours, I just tell you there's not a there's not a people on planet earth that I would rather be associated with than you people. And I mean that. Like you are my people, right? The church, believers, believers are our people because the bonds of Christ run deep. We feel this way because our heavenly father is not ashamed to be our father. The Lord Jesus is not ashamed to call us his bride. 
We love the church because as Spurgeon said, there is one among them who, whatever faults they may have, is so fair and lovely that he more than makes up for all of their imperfections. My Lord Jesus Christ, he says, in the midst of his people, makes them all fair in his fairness and makes me feel that to be poor with the poorest and most illiterate of the church of Christ meeting in a village barn is an unspeakable honor since he is among them. So you want to worship Jesus. You enter in with this congregation and you enter in to worship and to declare the greatness and the glory and the splendor and the majesty of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, and when we come together, it is meaningful. And when we go outside these doors, we take Jesus with us. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us and we are salt and light until we meet again. And we are refueled. Genuine faith, lastly and quickly, must possess the Lord as its richest treasure. Ruth says, your God shall be my God. The chief treasure of every believer is God, who is the lover of our souls. See, this is, this is what we get in our salvation. We get God. It was the inheritance of the Levites in the Old Testament. See, all the, the tribes of Israel, they dispersed and they they split up the land. God split up the land amongst them. But the Levites, he didn't give land to them. No, he gave them himself. He gave them himself. And so, friends, when we come in humility to Jesus, we, we come with the fear of God because he is not safe, but he is good. When you receive him by the free gift of his goodness through faith alone, you get the bread of life. You get the living water. You get the resurrection and the life. You get Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You get entrance into the sheepfold. And Jesus said, I am the door. You enter through me. And Jesus said, you get the good shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. And my sheep know my name. And they hear my voice. And they follow me. Jesus becomes the treasure of your heart when you turn to him and you trust in him. He becomes the greatest treasure of your heart and when Jesus is the greatest treasure of your heart, then you'll stand in him and you, he will carry you through the tests of this life and he will refine your faith in him and he'll, you'll be numbered with the saints of God, not because the saints are perfect, because they're not but because Jesus is perfect and he makes it all worth it. Amen? I hope that I've convinced you today that if you're not saved, to get saved, that if you've not put your faith and trust in Christ, that this would be that moment that to know that we are here for you we're here to help you. We're here to pray with you. We're here to point you to Christ. Okay, so during this invitation, if, if the Holy Spirit, you know whether the Spirit of God is pricking your heart and drawing you right now, you know if he's doing that work. And so I'm just, I'm just asking you, I'm pleading with you to obey him, to yield your heart to him, to surrender to him to step out, to take a step of bravery, of courage, of boldness, take a risk. And can I say it's, this is, the, this is the least riskiest place that you will step out and stand for Christ. Once we step outside these doors, well then it really gets risky. Then it really gets risky to stand for him. So I'm saying to you this morning, if you don't know Christ, please, during this closing song, Turn your eyes to Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Will you come to him and cling to him as Ruth clung to the God of Israel? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the kindness of your favor and I pray in these moments that, God, you would have prepared hearts to respond to you, to trust, to turn from their sin and to run to Jesus, their Savior, to cling to him, to escape the justice that is coming 
at the great white throne on judgment day and, oh, Father, to embrace the grace that is given through the crucifixion of Jesus who received our penalty. He was the just standing in place of the unjust so that we might go free. And so God, I pray that you would draw people who do not know you in these moments. Oh God, quicken their feet and let them move and let them receive Jesus as their Savior. Father, for those of us who have and do believe, God, will you help us to love, to be salt and light, to stand in the times of temptation and Father, to stand firm. We need you to do that work in us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. If God has spoken to your heart, you respond to him. Say the name.
All right, Leah has something she wants to share with you before we're dismissed. Oh, she's pulling the pulpit out. She's going to preach. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, really encouraged by the uh, songs we sang before um, the message today. Um, and it reminded me, we're, some of us, I know in the, many in the church are reading through the Bible um, this year with the reading plan. And the songs had a lot to do um, with the reading this week. Um, and I just want to share how it encouraged me. Um, first of all, the, the song, Behold Our God, um, such a powerful song. And uh, this week in our Bible reading, Isaiah 40, um, just, you know, it challenge, challenges us who, who question God, I guess. I suffer with self-righteousness, I, I think. You know, a lot of us kind of think our way is the best way. So you read something like Isaiah 40, who says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span? And just continues, you know, um, who can direct the spirit of the Lord? Who can counsel him? Um, and it just, it puts you in your place. Like, whoa, no, I can't do that. Any of that's just like uh, over and over. Wow, God, you're amazing. Um, so um, that song was very much of an encouragement um, and then also in our scripture reading um, is Revelation. And some parts of Revelation I love, and some parts I don't love. I mean, I know it's God's scripture. I don't mean anything against that. But <laughs> yeah, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, reading this week um, about the woe, the seven bowls of judgment, and the woes that are proclaimed on those going through the tribulation, um, and reading it, it, it it made my stomach churn. I read two chapters in a row one morning, and I was just like sad afterwards. I had to go back, because I was phys almost physically sick from reading about that. I had to go back and read in Isaiah again. I, I just made myself go back and be encouraged again about how great God is and how wonderful. Um, and the second song, Who is Worthy, um, Revelation 5, he also, this is a part I like. Um, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look in it. Then I, John, began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look in it. And one of the elders said, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and so is able to open the book and, break, and its seven seals. And later, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, do blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And just during this week, all the chaos in our world, more than I think that I've ever seen in my lifetime, we need to remember that Amen. Jesus is worthy. He, he does conquer. He, he uh, even in the midst of something that makes your stomach churn, mm -hmm. we know how it ends and that uh, Jesus is the, the perfect lamb to save us. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. It's good stuff. I should be afraid for my job right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, always, it's always interesting when someone comes up to me in a service and says, can I say something? And I'm like... <laughs> Um, I don't know, but good job, Leah. Good job. <sighs> oh, well, God bless you this week. Let me, let me close our service with this scripture as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. For the glory of Christ, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.